Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Templeton Prize Ceremony. Please welcome the 2019 Templeton Prize Laureate, Professor Marcelo Gleiser. Professor Gleiser, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Hanlon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I am Heather Templeton Dill, the president of the John Templeton Foundation. On behalf of the trustees of the John Templeton Foundation, I welcome all of you to the Templeton Prize, honoring the 2019 laureate, Professor Marcelo Gleiser, the Appleton Professor of Natural Philosophy and a professor of physics and astronomy at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. We are delighted to be here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and I want to thank the museum for the opportunity to hold this ceremony in the Grace Rainey Rogers Auditorium, named for a beloved patron of this magnificent cultural institution. I hope that everyone joining us for tonight's event will be inspired by the vision of the Templeton Prize and the accomplishments of the 2019 Laureate. Sir John Templeton created the Templeton Prize in 1972 to recognize what he called the marvelous new things going on in religion. In his mind, the world honored writers, musicians, scientists, economists, and other academics for their accomplishments, but no one recognized the many accomplishments of those who were motivated by a spiritual impulse Few appreciated that progress could be made in the spiritual realm of life, just as we make progress in science and in technology. Sir John Templeton wanted to celebrate the spiritual quest, and he created the Templeton Prize to do just that. Prize laureates have included humanitarians, such as Mother Teresa, Chiara Lubitsch, and Jean Vanier. And here I pause for a few moments to pay tribute to Jean Vanier, who received the Templeton Prize in 2015 and who passed away just a few weeks ago at the age of 90. Born in Geneva to a prominent Canadian family, Jean served in the Royal Navies of Great Britain and Canada. He earned a PhD and taught philosophy at the University of Toronto. But his life was forever transformed in 1963 when he visited several institutions in France for people with intellectual disabilities. He was horrified by what he encountered and by how the men there were treated. And so, deeply moved by this experience, he bought a dilapidated house north of Paris and invited two of those men to come and share the house with him and live together as friends. This simple decision launched a movement that spread from France to Canada, and to 149 locations around the world. Jean Vanier's singular insight was that these relationships, forged in the furnace of community life, can be uniquely and mutually transformative, where those without disabilities gain wisdom about the spiritual dimension of life through friendship with their disabled housemates. Jean Vanier was a man whose generosity, empathy, and loving kindness have inspired millions, and whose life's work provides a shining example of the way in which a deep spirituality contributes to human flourishing. In addition to these great humanitarians, the prize has also been given to religious figures, such as the Dalai Lama, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. Last year's laureate, his Majesty King Abdullah II of Jordan received the Templeton Prize for his commitment to intrafaith and interfaith dialogue. King Abdullah was honored for doing more to seek religious harmony within Islam and between Islam and other religions than any other political leader. He is another example of one motivated by spiritual or religious commitments to make progress and to improve the human condition. Most importantly, for the purposes of tonight's event, the judges for the Templeton Prize have also recognized scientists for their insights and for the way in which their scientific work has expanded our understanding of and appreciation for spiritual concepts. 
these have included physicists and astronomers such as Martin Rees, Freeman Dyson, and the Nobel laureate Charles Townes. In 1995, Dr. Paul Davies received the Templeton Prize in part for his ability to clearly articulate the profound questions that emerge when we understand more about the natural world. In his acceptance speech, Dr. Davies said, the contrived nature of physical existence is just too fantastic to take on board as simply given. It points forcefully to a deeper underlying meaning to existence. All of these laureates, the scientists, the humanitarians, and the religious leaders affirm that our interactions with one another and our religious traditions, as well as our spiritual insights, are relevant and essential ways of understanding and engaging with the world we inhabit. This year, we honor another scientist. Professor Marcelo Gleiser is receiving the 2019 Templeton Prize for his body of work that presents science as a spiritual quest to understand the origins of the universe and of life on Earth. Science, philosophy, and spirituality, he offers, are complementary expressions of humanity's need to embrace mystery and explore the unknown. Sir John Templeton wrote that a scientist can hardly be successful over the long term without being humble before the external realities which provide the enduring basis for his success in making discoveries. Marcello both embodies the spirit of humility and eloquently explains its, its importance. He writes in his book, The Island of Knowledge, that as we learn more, we become increasingly aware of that which we do not know or that which we cannot explain. It's a theme that reappears throughout Marcello's work in his books, in his essays, and in the many public events that he hosts both here in the US and in his native country, Brazil. For Marcello, this scientific impulse to endlessly explore mystery becomes a form of the spiritual impulse. Both are searching for meaning, purpose, and the answer to questions that belie easy answers. Both require robust philosophical models for making sense of new information. And neither science nor spiritual insights alone can provide a full picture of the nature of reality. In his book, The Simple Beauty of the Unexpected, Marcello writes that a key ingredient of the island metaphor is not only that are we surrounded by unknowns, but that some of these unknowns are unknowable. There are well-posed questions that science can't answer. Yet even in the face of the enduring unknown, Marcello displays an undeniable joy of exploration. In his research, his writing, and his speaking, he has found a way to create a constructive engagement between the sciences and the humanities and to propose a unifying vision rooted in an appreciation for humankind's uniqueness in the cosmos. And for these insights, we are proud to honor and celebrate Marcello's contributions. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the John Templeton Foundation, we congratulate the 2019 Templeton Prize Laureate, Professor Marcello Gleiser. I am now pleased to introduce our two speakers. They will each come up to speak in turn as noted in your program. Dr. Marilyn Robinson is a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist and an acclaimed essayist. She is the author of Housekeeping, Gilead, Home, and Lila, and nonfiction books including When I Was a Child, I Read Books, The Givenness of Things, and most recently, What Are We Doing Here? Dr. Robinson earned her PhD at the University of Washington and taught at the Writers' Workshop at the University of Iowa for 25 years. She is the recipient of the National Humanities Medal and the Library of Congress Lifetime Achievement Award in American Fiction, among many other distinctions. Her work is often rooted in theology and always searches for a deeper truth and meaning, just as Marcello does in his own writing. Dr. Philip J. Hanlon is the president of Dartmouth College and the 10th Dartmouth alumnus to serve as its president. 
Prior to becoming the president of Dartmouth, Dr. Hanlon served as provost and executive vice president for academic affairs at the University of Michigan, where he was also the Donald J. Lewis Collegiate Professor of Mathematics. His academic research is focused on probability and combinatorics and the study of finite structures in bioinformatics. He still teaches first-year calculus and other courses at Dartmouth. We will also have the pleasure this evening of listening to the Dartmouth Symphony Orchestra performing compositions chosen for this occasion by Marcello and the music director, Filippo Cibatte. Professor Gleiser selected the pieces we will hear tonight, noting that Mahler speaks to my heart and spirit, Villa Lobos to my Brazilian roots, and Mozart to the precision and mystery of the cosmic harmony. And later in the program, Secretary Emmanuel Lobo de Andrada, head of the cultural section of the Consulate General of Brazil in New York, will offer words of congratulations from the Consulate General. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to enjoy the program. Every time you're looking at the sky, you're looking back in time. Since light travels at a finite speed, it takes a while for the light from a star to reach our eyes. And so you never look at, at the sky as it is now. You always look at the sky as, as it was then. And that to me is really wonderful because the deeper you look into the universe, the closer to the moment of creation you're looking. The surf was low and the sun was already setting behind his back. Copacabana Beach lay bare in front of him. Here and there, older fishermen tried their luck along the beach, retired men in their 60s and 70s with little to do, their skin leathered from years under the tropical sun. They all knew the persistent 11-year-old who would come three or four times a week to the same spot with devout discipline. The routine was always the same. He would run to the water with the rod behind his back and cast the line as far as he could beyond the breaking surf. Entranced, he shifted his gaze back and forth from the distant horizon to the tip of the rod. He didn't know then why he had to fish, but he knew he did, alone. The most important event that happened during my formative years is that I lost my mother when I was a six-year-old boy. And you know, and when you're six and you lose your mom, life becomes very complicated. There's a prayer that is called the Iskor, which is the remembrance prayer, where you have to remember the people you lost. I was eight, and I'll go sit in my grandfather's lap, you know, at the synagogue to think about my mother. Like, that has to accelerate the way you think about the world and about life and about death. I was very much fascinated by time. Time to me was the biggest mystery. You know, how come somebody's here now and it's not in a, in a second? You know, what happened? Where does time start? Where does it go? How do we fit into this kind of long narrative of time? I was there to kind of find my place within myself and within this much larger scheme of things, you know, the world. And it allowed me to kind of develop a sense of loneliness that was okay for me to be with myself. And I think this kind of perception was very empowering to me because the life of a, a theoretical physicist, in some ways, is kind of the life of a writer or a poet. You know, you do spend a lot of time alone. When you study uh, the universe, you find out that there is this beautiful dance of life and death that is happening all the time. And the dancers are the stars themselves. You know, they are born and when they die, 
it turns out that their remains trigger the formation of new stars. And this has been perpetuating itself for almost 14 billion years in the history of the universe. And I find that a beautiful symbol of how the universe is always in transformation and change and in renewal. Two large silvery shadows darted 50 feet away, high on a wave. The boy retrieved his line quickly, hooked some fresh bait, and cast right behind where he had spotted the pair. For 10 minutes, nothing happened. Science is all about learning from failure. As is fishing, I always tell that to my grad students. I said, look, science is about research. Research. You search, and you search again, and you search again, and you search again, until you actually get to a result which is meaningful to you. And making sure that you are happy, not with the end result of the process, but it's the process itself that makes you happy. Theoretical physicists really deal with what we don't know about nature. You know, you go out there to try to understand something nobody has understood before, to discover a new phenomenon of nature. There is the intellectual challenge, but there is also the joy of being part of this game of discovery. Suddenly, he felt a strong tug. His arms turned rubbery. The boy ran to the water's edge, holding on to the rod with all his might, trying to reel line in. But he could hardly turn the handle. It wasn't a shark, but it was big. Bigger than anything he had ever caught or seen anyone caught at Copacabana Beach. There is something very visceral about discovering something new, something that no one has ever seen before. One of the things that people feel about modern science is that the more that we learn about the universe, the smaller we feel because the universe is so huge and there are so many galaxies and they're all expanding and we are just nothing in this huge vastness. It's quite the opposite because we are the molecular machines that are able to have self-awareness and to understand and to ask all these questions about the universe and our place in it. When you are searching for life in other planets, other worlds, in our solar system, we start to realize how precious Earth actually is. And Earth is this oasis with exploding with life and its diversity. And once you understand that, you start to look at Earth with different eyes. The mission of our generation and the one that follows is to actually preserve life and also our planet with everything that we've got because the truth is, the Earth will exist without us, but we cannot exist without the Earth. So as the years went by, I also started to realize that uh, the act of fishing, even though it's very beautiful and elegant, is you are imposing your will on a creature that has nothing to do with you, and I just couldn't live with that. If I wanted to connect to nature, there are many, many other ways, and the way I found was to trail and mountain running. This sort of symbolism that putting your body so viscerally close to nature, that you're running like your ancestors, is to me a way of celebrating how much we are part of this beautiful world that we live in. So much of us humans, so much of our creative impulse is an engagement with what we don't know, with the mystery of love, with the mystery of nature, and so to get to the end of something like knowledge, this quest for knowledge, is awful because it will stop us from being who we are. You know, creatures which are mysteriously connected with the unknowables of existence.
It's an honor to be here this evening to help celebrate this honor that has been brought to Professor Gleiser, who has done so much to draw attention to the fact that science is a profound revelation of human nature and human brilliance, itself appropriately a subject of awe. A few months ago, I picked up a book by the Yale physicist Henry Morganow, published in 1950, titled The Nature of Physical Reality. I like to look at books from the mid-century on this subject to see how the conversation develops. This writer says something I have not seen elsewhere in a literature substantially under the sway of logical positivism. He says, to deny the presence, indeed the, ne uh, the necessary presence, of metaphysical elements in any successful science is to be blind to the obvious, although to foster such blindness has become a highly sophisticated endeavor in our time. The book is largely taken up with quantum physics. I find it to be true that the more receptive a writer is to this remarkable new physics, the less insistent he is on the idea that science, by definition, must adhere to the assumptions of radical empiricism. If this seems inevitable, there are still many radical empiricists, self-proclaimed defenders of science, to prove that it is not. Science and metaphysics are alienated sisters. They are two manifestations of one phenomenon, human wonder at human circumstance. From the earth we stand on to the dreams we dream to our being creatures in time. Neither science nor religion can make an account of time. It is a Heraclitian river that carries us with it and everything else as well. Both science and religion are too often confident that they know the essential things, or at least that they know what the great answers will look like when they find their way to them. But the oldest mysteries abide. Science faults religion, metaphysics at ground level, for dogmatism. Dogma can be found in any, in any religion in isolation, but religion is global, clearly a much larger phenomenon than any local tenet is sufficient to capture or to discredit. Science is seen as soulless and pedestrian, but, it's cos <coughs> pardon me, but in its cosmos, there is a great dark epic of dispersion and cohesion now unfolding always more astonishing with every glimpse we have of it. Metaphysics could help us consider the, f the fact that this Aegon is full of yet unreadable implications for the fate of the universe, its being in time. Absolutely nothing is proved by the fact that myth and mysticism <clears throat> taught the ancients to think at a scale now reckoned in light years. Nothing from a little distance, <clears throat> nevertheless from a little distance it does look as though a prevenient wonder prepared us for the scale and force of a cosmos laggard science is only now discovering. One sister knew that reality had a first moment. Myth, the younger sister said. And so it was and is, but until a two, few decades ago only myth could have made such an absolute statement about the nature of things. Quantum seems to negotiate between classical causality and mythic fiat. Let there be, and there was. Why this alienation? Marcelo Gleiser very agreeably calls himself a natural philosopher, a term used by scientists to describe themselves before the great schism. He proposes and demonstrates a reintegration of primal joy and attentiveness into science as it is practiced now, to acknowledge the old fascination, itself unaccountable, that has made humankind a race of profound inquirers. There was a long and influential period during which it was widely believed by scientists, too, that scientific progress meant the ultimate demystification of the world. This is the error of mistaking description for explanation. Granting some version of evolution, what is the impetus behind it? 
Why should there be ostriches and hummingbirds when viruses, those great survivors and niche finders, mastered self-replication and effective mortality, immortality eons ago? Accident, they say. Then accident is a genius with an elegant touch and an, an inexhaustible sense of humor. Be that as it may, at this point we know far too much to imagine that the wonder of existence could ever be diminished by a better knowledge of it. Cotton Mathers, the Christian philosopher, published in 1721, is a compendium of the best scientific thought of his time. For Mather, as for Newton, Boyle, and others, God is very much a given, his existence in no need of demonstration. Therefore, Mather can respond to the brilliance of nature's operations as the psalmist does, with reverent amazement at the world in itself, unburdened by the expectation that it should serve as a theological proof text. No one can dispute the ma that major science was done on these assumptions. Mather says this about Newton's theory of gravity. It is now evident that the most universal principle of gravitation, the spring of almost all the great and regular inanimate <clears throat> motions in the world, answering that not at all to the surfaces of bodies by which alone they can be, uh, they can act upon one another, but entirely to their solid content cannot possibly be the result of any motion originally impressed on matter, but must of necessity be caused by something which penetrates the very substance of all bodies and continually puts forth in them a force or power entirely different from that by which matter acts on matter. Gravity is perpetually and actually exerting itself every moment in every part of the world." End of quote. Inevitably, this count of, account of a force that is constant, efficacious, and ubiquitous calls up for Mather and his peers providence in the divine will. Gravity has a center everywhere and a circumference nowhere. Metaphysics could have prepared these variously pious men to describe its in essential ways a force science still does not understand. Marcelo Gleiser proposes that science approach the world with a wider sense of the ways in which reality is knowable to enlist in its methods and effects the insights offered by compassion and also delight. Thank you.
Well, good evening. What a thrill to be part of this celebration in honor of my colleague and a distinguished member of our faculty, Marcelo Gleiser, the Appleton Professor of Natural Philosophy and Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Dartmouth. Heather Templeton Dill invited me to say a few words tonight about Marcelo, his work, and what his Templeton Prize honor means to our campus community. So let me cut to the chase. It means everything. I couldn't be prouder that Marcelo is the first Dartmouth faculty member to receive this prestigious honor and the first Latin American to win the Templeton Prize, joining an eminent roster of past Templeton Prize laureates that includes Mother Teresa, Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and the Dalai Lama, amongst others. So that's some pretty, truly extraordinary company. But I'm most proud that Marcelo has chosen to teach and conduct his research at Dartmouth. Marcelo has dedicated his life to exploring the deepest and most perplexing questions facing humankind. The very question of our existence and the origins of the universe. Now, he is certainly not the first to explore these questions, but never have I seen an individual so committed to doing so in a pluralistic way. Those of you who are familiar with Mar Marcello's work know that he is never one to pit science against religion. To the contrary, it's his belief that complementary and multidisciplinary approaches are needed to make sense of our existence and that has led to his breakthrough discoveries. And I believe it is amongst the reasons he's honored tonight with the Templeton Prize. Marcello is a scientist, that's a fact, but he also understands the limitations of science. He advocates for a more complementary approach to knowledge, arguing that science alone cannot lead to ultimate truths about the nature of reality. This is neither a deterrent nor a defeatist attitude. As Marcello notes in the prologue to his most recent book, The Island of Knowledge, and I quote, limits should not be seen as insurmountable obstacles, but as challenges. What could be more inspiring, he writes, than knowing that there will always be something new to discover in the natural world. On an even, even deeper level, Marcello recognizes that any scientific attempts to answer the fundamental questions of existence lead to deeper questions about what it means to be human. Marcello pioneered the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement at Dartmouth, which has received generous support from the Templeton Foundation. This institute brings together humanists and scientists to explore deep questions that lie at the interface of science and the human experience and he regularly welcomes the public into that discussion. For the past decade, he has also helped place science in a broader context as an expression of our very human need to make sense of the world and our place in it through his 13.7 Cosmos and Culture blog on National Public Radio. When we were meeting in my, in my office last week, Marcello recalled a quote from Albert Einstein who said, the most beautiful thing that we can experience is the mysterious. Marcelo believes that to his core. And so tonight, I simply want to thank him for showing us that science is but one way for us to engage in the mystery of who we are. Marcelo, you have brought tremendous pride to Dartmouth and to your native Brazil. On behalf of all of us at Dartmouth, thank you for your contributions to your field to our community, and to our scientific and spiritual understanding of our universe and ourselves. And congratulations on this exceptional and well-deserved honor. Professor Marcelo Glazer, Ms. Heather Templeton Dill, Dr. Marilyn Robinson, Dr. Philip and Helen, 
distinguished guests, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Emmanuel Lobo de Andrade, Deputy Consul of Brazil in New York. It is a great honor to extend on behalf of the Consulate General of, of Brazil my congratulations to this year's recipient of the Templeton Prize, Brazilian physicist and astronomer Marcelo Glazer. This is indeed the culmination of a breadth of accomplishments in a very distinguished academic career. At an early age, Professor Glazer would marvel at the skies of his native Rio de Janeiro from the vantage point of Copacabana, where he would contemplate some of the greatest celestial sights of the southern hemisphere. He started asking questions about the origins of the material world, to which he would later on rigorously try to find answers to the scientific method. But Professor Glazer proposes a well-reasoned, much humbler approach to knowledge, reminding us that science alone cannot provide all answers about the nature of reality, and that the spiritual dimension of human existence is at no odds with what is called the undeniable joy of exploration. In Brazil, Professor Glazer has been a tremendous source of inspiration through his books, essays, TV documentaries, helping new generations develop an interest in scientific subjects, and managing to write and to communicate with high standards while still appealing to wide audiences in our country. I'd like to thank the Templeton Foundation for the recognition of Professor Glazer's work. I can say for certain the Brazilians are proud of the achievements in his career as a public intellectual and grateful for his contributions to science, philosophy, and spirituality. Thank you very much. There are two components to the Templeton Prize. The first is this beautiful scroll. Every year we create a scroll with the name of the recipient. It indicates that you are receiving the prize this year. And there are a number of images on the scroll that speak to you and your life's work. I'm delighted to recognize the artist who is here with us this evening. She has produced these scrolls for the last few years. Tonight is her first Templeton Prize ceremony. And in your case, there are a few images. One is the snow-capped mountains, which is reminiscent of the place where you call home today. There's also a trail through a forest here, and that speaks to your passion for running, which is a passion you share with your wife, Carrie. There's also a, a fishing rod on the uh, side of the scroll close to you, and that speaks to your passion for fishing as a young boy, but also you picked up the hobby of fly fishing a few years ago, and I, you no longer pursue that hobby, but you write beautifully about it in the simple beauty of the unexpected. The stars represent what inspired you to become a scientist, and the E equals MC squared is the foundation of physical systems, so that speaks to your work as a physicist. There are a few other symbols, a guitar, a running shoe down in the corner there, but then this earth also represents the work you do on origins of life research, your leadership in the astrobiology community, as well as your doctrine of human centrism that emphasizes the centrality of humanity to our cosmos. The second element of the Templeton Prize is this Tree of Life medallion. And this year, the medallion includes a ribbon with the colors of the Brazilian flag, which I think is appropriate. And the medallion is the tree of life. It represents the depth and the breadth of the meaning of the Templeton Prize. On behalf of the trustees of the John Templeton Foundation, I congratulate you on receiving the 2019 Templeton Prize. Congratulations. Oh, can you hold the medal?
Okay, it's my turn to work now. Let me start by saying that uh, I am deeply humbled and moved to have been chosen the 2019 Templeton Prize Laureate. To be in the company of such wonderful individuals who have devoted their lives to improve the human condition and our mutual understanding is to me an immeasurable honor. I want to express my deep gratitude to the Templeton family and to the John Templeton Foundation for their trust in my work and ideas over the years. This is an evening to celebrate the memory and vision of Sir John Templeton, who understood so well that spirituality is an essential measure of human progress, that we do not measure progress only through material accomplishment, but we have to look at the hearts of people to really understand who we are. I want to thank Heather Templeton Dill from the bottom of my heart for her support and for setting a very unique example of how to combine leadership and humility, something the world badly needs these days. Over the years, the John Templeton Foundation has become an essential source of support and inspiration to countless members of academia and intellectual visionaries, individuals who are pushing the boundaries of human knowledge and understanding, and for that, and I know I'm speaking for many of my colleagues, we are very, very grateful. I thank Joanna Almond, Lynn Coletta, Don Lair, and Ben Carlson, and the whole Templeton Prize team from, because they really are absolutely spectacularly efficient people. And this night would have been impossible without their work. I thank Adam Frank, my dear friend and colleague, for having nominated me and all my Dartmouth colleagues, some of them who made all the way down from Hanover to here, current and past graduate students who are also here and who made the trip for this evening. And it's still finals time, so kudos to you. Marilyn, thank you so much for your kind words. I was so honored and thrilled that you made it and that you accepted to, to, uh, to come to this evening. Phil, thank you for your wonderful words. I'm very proud to be part of the Dartmouth family for almost 30 years now. I'm getting old. Um, but it's been a wonderful experience all along, and I couldn't be happier to be working there. And Secretary Lobo, thank you for your kind words. I'm very, very proud to be honoring our country in this way, in such an unexpected fashion, so to speak. Finally, I want to thank my family members and dear friends who have traveled from as far as Rio and Paris, oh, and Chicago and Los Angeles and Cape Cod to be here tonight. And all of you that could not have made it in person but are here in spirit. I thank my brothers, Luis and Rogério, for their love of, of all through these years, for their our togetherness has been unfailing. I thank my cousins, one of them made a trip to here, who happens to be a top-notch Spinozan philosopher, and I'm very happy that you made it, Marcus, here. And of course, my many friends who are here tonight, some of them from grade school in Rio, who live in New York now, and also those that couldn't be. I thank my wonderful wife and companion, Carrie, who has, with her bright inner light, illuminated my path forward over the years, showing me that happiness, as opposed to a lot of physics, is not an abstraction. <laughs> and last but not least, I thank my five amazing children sitting here on the front row, Andrew, Eric, Tali, Lucien, and Gabriel, all here tonight for always keeping me on my toes, for inspiring me, for their unconditional love, and for keeping me open to the new and the unexpected. They're always surprising you. Okay, now we begin. I want to talk tonight a little bit about our human disquietude. We are very peculiar creatures because we have this urge to know, and yet we're also limited in our knowledge. There was a French philosopher from the late uh, 1600s called Bernard Le Bouvier de Fontenelle, and in 1686, he published a book, which, by the way, is the same year that Isaac Newton published his book on gravity that Marilyn mentioned. Uh, so Bernard Le, Le Beauvais de Fontenelle wrote a book about a conversation on a plurality of worlds, meaning other planets out there and the possibility of life 
in other places in 1686. Now, this book was very interesting because it had two characters only. It was a conversation between a philosopher and a marquis, so a noble woman who uh, was a very, very rare, if not non-existent thing, to put a woman as a protagonist in a book at that time. And furthermore, she was smarter than the philosopher was, who was the author of the book, and she would always ask, ask him very difficult questions. So one of the questions that she asked was, um, why do you do what you do? You know, what is philosophy? And, and he says, well, you can summarize philosophy in two ways. It's just a sum of two things. Philosophy is about curiosity and short-sightedness. And I think that's just beautiful because it sort of encapsulates the whole idea that we as humans, we want to always know more and know more about ourselves, about our lives, about nature, about the world, and yet we can't. I mean, we progress, we move forward as we develop knowledge, but there is always a limit, a limitation of what we can see. That's the short-sightedness. And so what we do is something quite wonderful. We create instruments, I call them reality amplifiers, that will allow us to see farther into reaches of reality which are hidden to us if we only use the five senses. Because if there is something quite amazing about what's going on right now here, it's not just the ceremony, which is this wonderful celebration, but there are trillions of neutrinos coming all the way from the heart of the sun, going through your bodies per second. And we have no idea this is happening. And you would never have known about neutrinos, about the heart of the sun, and how it shines, and how it creates all the energy that makes life in this planet possible if we had not developed scientific ways of thinking about the world, amplifiers, machines, instruments that allow us to see farther out. And we do this in a creative way, and we have done this for centuries. And in fact, you know, you can even tell this history of astronomy and the history of science in general as a history of scientific instruments. And it is kind of an uncanny coincidence that today, the 29th of May, is the 100th anniversary of the confirmation of Einstein's theory of relativity. And guess where it was confirmed? In Brazil. So 100 years ago, two teams of astronomers from England uh, uh, with, uh, with Arthur Eddington, who was an eminent astrophysicist at the time. One went to the, um, the western coast of Africa, to the Ivory Coast. The other one, the other team went to uh, Brazil, to the city of Sobral, which is in the state of Ceará. Hundred years ago, to the day, there was a solar eclipse, and what Einstein said was something that was going to make us rethink what Newton said about things attract one another, because there is some invisible action at a distance. It was a very magical, weird thing to imagine that it is possible for two bodies that have a mass to attract one another and, and instantaneously. So the sun attracts the earth. How does that happen? Newton was very smart when people said, what is going on? How could the sun and the earth attract one another in this way? He would say, I feign no hypothesis. I don't know, but I can describe this interaction with my theory. So, long time after, Einstein came up and says, let's rethink Newton. And he said that actually gravity is the curvature of space. So if you have a mass, space around that mass is gonna be curved. Now, how can you possibly prove such a crazy idea, right? So one way you can do it is, well, if you have a star that is very, very far away and its light is traveling towards us, and if it goes through the sun on its way, the sun is pretty massive, and hence, according to Einstein, the star would have its light path bent because of the gravity of the sun. And he calculated his theory exactly how much of a deflection is a really tiny, tiny deflection, much smaller than one degree. But astronomy, because of the instruments that have been created at the time, actually, they could measure that because there was enough precision. So the two teams went, one went to, the one that went to Africa, they got bad weather. In Brazil, the weather is not great, but it was good enough to, on this day, look at it. Because you see, the problem is, 
when you're looking at a star, it has to be nighttime. So that doesn't work because the sun is not here. So what do you do? Well, when there is an eclipse, what's going to happen? The moon is going to go right in front of the sun. It's going to block the sunlight, and you have night during the day. And I actually led two Dartmouth Club, uh, Dartmouth alumni cruises to see eclipses with carry, and it's an absolutely spectacular, visceral experience, something that really connects you with a, with a part of, of, of nature that we really don't know until you actually sense it. It's not something you can explain with words. It's something you have to feel, you know, and that's something very important. Sometimes it's not just about the rational explanation of things, but it's really how you relate emotionally to things, and eclipses are very much like that. But for the astronomers on that day, they were on a mission. They really didn't care about the visceral connection with the nature, or with the natural world, so they actually measured the thing during the, the solar eclipse. Now, this is really, really amazing that this happened exactly 100 years ago, because Einstein, as Phil Handel mentioned, you know, was one that said something about the mysterious, right? And in that quote, he says something that the mysterious is the fundamental emotion that is at the cradle of all creativity in the arts and the sciences. So this speaks to our human disquietude again. You know, the notion that we humans have this urge to understand who we are, where we came from, where are we going, is this going to happen forever? Are we going to be in this planet forever? Is the sun going to shine forever? You know, what is the history that led from the beginning of the universe to where we are right now? So I'm really proud to have spent more than 30 years now working on these things, thinking about these things, to learn many, many things about the universe, but also to learn many, many things about humans. And one of the things that I really learned during this experience is that science teaches us humility. You may find that kind of surprising because you do find a lot of arrogant people in academia, right? And, and it reminds me of something my grandfather used to say. You know, he used to say that arrogant people are those people that wear hats which are bigger than their hats so their eyes are covered. And, and I think that's beautiful because it is a form of not seeing. And one of the things we do see when we pursue science is that we really don't know very much. We have learned a lot, and we are learning a lot very quickly in many different fields. But the metaphor that I created in this book called The Island of Knowledge, I think speaks to the heart of how this works because so the idea is simple, is that if you imagine that everything that we know about the world fits in an island, right? And this island is growing as we learn more and more about the universe, about who we are, etc. But as every good island, this one is surrounded by a notion of the unknown. unknown. So the paradox of knowledge is that as you learn more, the boundaries between what you know and what you don't know, they're always growing which means that as you learn more, you're able to ask questions that you couldn't have even conceived of before. Just think of, like now we are talking about the digital era and information and data mining. 50 years ago, this didn't exist. Why did this happen? Because we developed knowledge to do that, that allow us to expand the boundaries of more knowledge. And that is, to me, an endless pursuit. And those people that believe that there is an end to science, there is an end to the way we can think about the world, and we are going to go there and conquer, like if it were some kind of war, that there is a winner in the end, and it's us and reason, I think are deeply mistaken. Because one of the things that we learn in the process is that we don't know enough and we'll never know enough. And that is actually wonderful, because it is the not knowing that allows us to want to know more. It is wanting to know that makes us matter as people. So in the search, in this quest for knowledge, we find meaning. We understand better why we're here. And why we're here, we're here to understand better who we are in this process called the pursuit of knowledge. And another thing that I have learned in these years, and this is really coming from modern science, really last 15 years, where we have been able to look at planets indirectly going around other stars, not just our sun, but other stars far, far away. 
And the more we learn about the universe, the more we learn about these other worlds, the more we realize what a special planet the Earth is. Okay? It's not just because it has water and it's in what we call you know, the habitable zone where water can be liquid. Other planets will do that too. There can be other planets out there. If you think of our, our galaxy alone, there are about a trillion or more worlds. And so clearly, just statistically, you know, some of them may look like the Earth, but Earth is special. Earth is special because it has all these special properties that allow for life to appear here about 3.5 billion years ago and to evolve in fits and starts in complicated ways, in ways that could not have been predicted, in ways that if they had been changed, the course of life in this planet would have been different and we wouldn't be here. So there is a contingency to the human condition, which has to do with the way our planet evolved over three billion years. And that, you know, is something quite beautiful because it responds, it answers this thing about what we call the Copernican angst. You know, the notion I think Heather mentioned before, that the more we know about the universe, this is what people think scientists are saying, the more we know about the universe, the less important we become. Right? We were at the center of everything, then we were pushed aside, and then we're just in a planet, and then the sun is not the center, and then we have a galaxy, but then there are hundreds of billions of other galaxies. There's one indignation after another. You know, we keep pushing out, and what is the point of all this? And so we're discovering all these things to realize we don't matter. Well, that is exactly wrong, because it's exactly when we look at the other worlds, when we look at how rare our planet is, how rare life is, because you go to Mars and you go to Venus and you go to Jupiter, you're not going to find anything. You certainly, if Mars had life, it didn't build radio telescopes or compose Mahler's Fifth Symphony, right? I mean, for sure. So there is something very special about this planet, and there is something very special about us, humans, in this planet, because we are the creatures that are able to understand or try to understand our origins. We are self-aware molecular machines capable of wonder and of awe. And that, to me, is something that should be celebrated every day. And more than that, given the times that we're living on right now, where the Earth is being stressed by overpopulation and pollution and tornadoes in New York, this is really crazy, tornadoes in New York, this is a moment for us to reflect on who we are, not as a tribe here against a tribe there, but as a species, a one species unified in a planet, and we need to be together now more than ever and to celebrate and respect life and respect one another, and respect is not enough. You need to be open to learn from other people that think differently from what we, the way we think, because only there, only then we'll be able to understand one another better, go beyond the tribal divides that have been a real problem in the modern world. They were very useful 10,000 years ago. They're not very useful anymore. We need to unite as a species so that we have a future, that we have to be proud to leave the world to the future generations a better place than we found. And that, to me, is the moral imperative of our time. And that is what I want to dedicate my next few years and the honor of having the Templeton Prize for, to create a sense of moral imperatives where we humans are together trying to save this planet and life with everything that we've got. Thank you.
before we close, I want to thank the Dartmouth Symphony Orchestra for being with us this evening and for the wonderful pieces that you played. I understand today is the last day of classes, so for those of you who skipped class to be here, thank you for being here. And for those of you who look like you maybe didn't skip class, I also appreciate the time that you dedicated to this evening. Thank you also to Secretary Manuel Lobo de Andrada for being here with us this evening, to Dr. Hanlon for representing Dartmouth College, to Dr. Robinson for reminding us that even in our scientific age, the mysterious <laughs> remains. And I thank also, um, well first I also want to thank my colleagues from the John Templeton Foundation. First, Don Lair from the Nolan Lair Group, Joanna, Dawn, Lynn, Susan, Jonathan, Ben, Alyssa, and Chris. They made this event possible. They made this event an, an opportunity to honor Marcelo's life and work. And finally, to Marcelo Gleiser, congratulations on receiving the 2019 Templeton Prize. Sir John Templeton talked about humans as being co-creators with God, and by that he meant that we actually have a role in bringing about a world, or continuing to uh, bring about a world where humans may flourish and thrive and grow, and I think that was also Marcella's call to us this evening. And so now I invite all of you to join us for a reception in the Great Hall. I hope you will stay and continue the celebration over drinks, food, and dessert. Thank you very much for being with us this evening.